Hi, I'm Selena from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Lisa McMahon, who is a young adult and also a uh, middle grade writer. And Lisa, for people unfamiliar with your work, how would you describe exactly what you write? Oh, um, I write, uh, well, I have eight books that are young adult books, and most of them are paranormal. I've got one that's a realistic fiction. Um, And then I have, let's see, 20, 21 middle grade books. Uh, And I write a lot of series. So I'm most known for the Unwanted series. That's been around. uh, The first book, I think, came out in 2011. And there are actually... Uh, seven books in the first series, and then we did a spinoff series with seven more books. So we've got the Unwanted series and then the Unwanted's Quests. And um, I also have the Going Wild trilogy, which um, came out during that time with the Unwanted's. Uh, and I have a new series that I just started called The Forgotten Five. And book two uh, just came out and I've been touring around with this book uh, for, man, the past six weeks or so. And now I'm home. Um, So uh, Lisa, what can uh, readers expect from your newest book? Right. So Forgotten Five, you can kind of see this over my shoulder. That's the first book in the series. And it's about those five kids on the cover. They are supernatural kids. They were born and raised in a deserted hideout. And uh, they, the reason they've been here in this hideout all their lives with no electricity, no technology, uh, it's because their parents are supernatural criminals who escaped from the big city of Estero 15 years before the book begins. So those criminal parents were not parents at the time when they were in the middle of a heist. They're supernatural and they were shunned from society and they were trying to steal something from the president of Estero when they realized they were about to get caught. So they managed to get away in their helicopter and fly off to their secret hideout. And um, they raised their families there. Um, But a few years before the book begins, seven of the eight parents left and didn't return. And that left one parent who right before the book begins got sick and his name is Lewis and he's the dad of um, two of those kids and Lewis got sick and he passed away. And that's where the book begins with these five kids all alone in this tropical hideout. No one knows they exist. They're forgotten by their own parents and the rest of the world doesn't know they're even around that they, that they exist at all. And they're faced with a dilemma. Um, The plan was for them to just stay here in this hideout forever. But um, then Birdie, the one in the center holding that flaming map, she finds a note and a map from her father in her father's things. And the note says, Birdie, I want you to go to Estero, find your mother and give her this map. And that turns everything on its head. Birdie's now thinking, you know, we were planning to stay here forever because it's safe here for us. We know that people like us, supernatural people, are shunned uh, in Estero, and it's even against the law to be supernatural there. So we're safe here. We're going to stay here. But now she's got this note, this dying wish from her father to go to Estero and find her mother, who she really wants to find. And she didn't know that dad thinks mom is there. You know, she didn't know that, um, you know, dad was even planning to tell her to do this. So this has come as quite a shock, but uh, she opens this map that her father has left behind and it bursts into flames. Uh, He's he's, uh, supernaturally... Um, he has a, a fire supernatural ability, uh, so he put a charm on it. And she, when the flames die down, she sees that this is a map to Estero. And also marked on the map is a hidden treasure that those supernatural criminal parents left behind 15 years before. And that makes Birdie wonder, does my mom need this map because she needs to get to the, the stash? 
Uh, and if that's the case, is that what's keeping her from coming home to us? So she's got a big job to do to change everybody's minds uh, and actually go into this dangerous territory in order to find one of the parents. Uh, so that's a little bit about how book one begins. And in book one, at the end of this book, um, they meet a new supernatural person who becomes sort of like a member of their team. And she's on the cover of book two. Um, there she is right in the center. Her name is Lada. And Lada has kind of that um, brownish red hair with the white blouse on and the shorts. And she's using um, the forearm crutches. And Lada is a supernatural 13-year-old who was born and raised in Estero. Um, or at least that's what she thinks. She was actually, at four days old, brought to the Sunrise Foster Home there. And um, she's lived there her whole life. And uh, when she was one or two, she was diagnosed with cerebral palsy and now uses the forearm crutches and a wheelchair to move around. But when she was 10, she was very shocked to find out that she's a supernatural person too. Uh, and that is quite a shock to her because it's against the law to be supernatural. And she's even been among you know, everyone at, at the foster home would talk about how terrible the supernatural people were. And now here she is one of them and she has to figure out what to do with that. But she becomes a, a key player in the series, um, in the invisible spy. And, uh, it was just a lovely book to write. I've already written book three. Um, there's a cover out there floating around on the internet. You can see, and I'm working on book four now. Wow, <laughs> that's great. So it's really now becoming the forgotten six. <laughs> you know, I get that question a lot from kids. <laughs> They're like, why don't, why didn't you change it to the forgotten six for title of the, the series title of book two? And, and I think, you know, a lot of kids don't really realize that it makes it really hard as a bookseller for you to look up which... <laughs> you're looking up so that's <laughs> exactly. the main reason why I did it but it really does center around these these forgotten kids Lada is out there in the open you know and she is forgotten in her own way so she fits right in but um yeah there, it's mostly because we didn't want to change the series title <laughs> exactly <laughs> forgotten kids <laughs> right, right. okay so what was the um inspiration for these books for the series I always loved The Incredibles. Uh, I love supernatural heroes. Um, when I saw The Incredibles and saw that family unit working together, I'm like, I love that. I want more of that, more of the family cohesiveness. But then I got to thinking, what about the children of the criminals, of the villains? you know, the villain supernatural people, what about their, their family? Is their family as cohesive as the Incredibles would be? And that got my mind really churning about, you know, what it would be like to be the children of supernatural villains. And would they follow in their parents' footsteps or would they go a different route? And what would that look like? Maybe some of them do one thing and some do the other. You just never know. Okay. So what kind of research went into writing these books? Um, if you had to do any research at all? Absolutely. I do a lot of research. Um, in book one, I remember having to research um, communication devices and like how ear pieces work when you've got five different people on a channel and uh, stuff like that. But um, especially with book two, with the invisible spy, well, even at the end of book one, I'm introducing a new character who has a physical disability that I don't have. And so that was a really big part of the research process for this series because Lada is such a main character. Um, and I knew writing, starting book one, that I wanted to introduce a character with, dis with a disability into the story. I reached out to my friend, Stacy, who I've known since 
um, I was in my mid twenties and she was probably like still a teenager. Um, I was a bookseller myself yeah. for 10 years. Yeah. I worked at an independent bookstore for 10 years in Michigan. And, um, I had, when I was like 18 or 19, I was working there and I met Stacy, who would come into the store all the time to buy up all the Sweet Valley High books. And she just loved those. Um, but she has cerebral palsy and we just became friends. And when she was old enough to work there, I was the manager of the store and I hired her. And we had a great couple of years together. And then she was in college and she was becoming a psychologist and I was moving on to do real estate um, and are we, you know, we fell away from each other, but we've always kept in touch. And, um, when I started writing this book, I thought, you know, I would love for Stacy to be my sensitivity reader and to help me write this character who has this disability of cerebral palsy. And, uh, she, I reached out to her and she said, absolutely. She would love to. So. Uh, that was, but it's been quite a process. I've had to learn so much um, about how Lada would react in certain situations that I haven't thought of because I'm in, you know, not a disabled person. That's wonderful to be able to do that. Wow. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what is your favorite research story? And it, it's not necessarily with the Forgotten Five, but all together with any of your books. Oh man, this is a tough one. Um, I did have a lot of fun researching. Uh, one of the characters in the Forgotten Five, Cabot, uh, loves explosives. <laughs> so doing some research on that has been a lot of fun. I've watched a lot of Burn Notice, which is a TV show <laughs> that had several seasons um, to learn about that. And uh, But probably my favorite research story is from the Unwanted series. There in book five, you meet the Japanese scientists who show up and in uh, the island of shipwrecks. And I needed a way for them to enter this magical world that doesn't really exist. Um, and I figured a way to do that was through a ship that goes down in the Dragon's Triangle back in the 1950s. This is a true story that happened. And I just, you know, magically planted these three scientists onto that ship that went down. And that's how they ended up here in this magical world. And so they're sort of holding the key to where everything is in the unwanted world. Um, but doing the research on that was so interesting because the ship um, and I'm, I can't quite remember the name now. It's been a few years since I wrote that book. Uh, Kaya Maru, number five, something like that. I think I just butchered that, the name of the ship, but it's something like that. But that was a, a, a ship full of scientists who were out in search of another ship that had gone down uh, in that area of the Dragon's Triangle. And if you're not familiar with the Dragon's Triangle, it's kind of like the Bermuda Triangle, but it's over south of Japan. So, um, yeah, so that was one of the most fun research projects, just learning about that ship that went down. Oh, interesting. Okay. So what was, um, what was your biggest challenge in writing and, and putting out, uh, Forgotten Five? Um, you know, it was, it was something I was working on right after, the unwanted series finished and that was book 14 of a series so i was starting fresh with new characters with also with a new publishing house and a new editor and i'd had my previous editor for all 14 books of the unwanted series so um that was a little bit scary to start fresh with someone um and it's always a little bit difficult writing the first book of a series Mm. Um, you want to really balance how much, how much backstory to put in that first book, how much description of the location, because you don't want to bog it down at the beginning of the series. 
Uh, so it's a, it's a very interesting balance trying to get the story off going, but also be an origin story for a whole series. Uh, so that was probably the most challenging. Mm-hmm. And how many books do you project might be in this series, just out of curiosity? I'm hoping for seven. I ha- I can see a path to seven in, in my notes. I don't, I'm not super like, I don't write out all kinds of um outlines and things like that. But I have a couple of paragraphs on what has to happen in the next book and the next one and the next one and that sort of thing. And that mm-hmm. that's how I've always done it. And that always proves to work pretty well for me. And based on that, I think seven books is going to be about right. Okay. I was going to ask you if you're uh, a, uh, a pantser or a, an outline writer. More of a pantser. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I do take a few notes, especially at the older I get. Um, I'm but memory wise, I need to take a few more notes than I used to have to do. But um, I have so many books still floating around in my head, you know. Um, but yeah, I usually am more of a let's just see where this goes. And I have okay. a really strong feeling about what how how does this book end? How or the series? How does the series end? I always know that. Okay. And, I know that, then I can start writing. Ah, okay. That's great. Um, So what character did you really like the most or hate the most in in the Forgotten Five? This is so hard because I do love them all. I love, I even love the, the terrible characters. Um, Probably Cabot, who is right here on the cover with the short blonde hair or tenor who's back here on this ladder. Um, they're both a lot like me. Tenor's super awkward. He says the wrong thing at times and then tries to make up for it. And then he just steps in it even further and further. And he just has a lot of trouble with that. (laughs) And uh, he's trying to figure it out. He's trying to figure out how to be a good friend to the others, but he overdoes it. Um, And that's probably me. Uh, Cabot is, um, she's kind of a sneaky little spy and she loves to know what everyone's doing at all times. And I'm very much like that as well. So I put these characteristics in those two characters. Um, So they're probably among my favorites. Okay. Um, What else can we expect from you in the near future? Well, book three of this series Mm -hmm. is called Rebel Undercover, and it comes out June 6. And we just decided on the title for book four just yesterday. And I'm just going to reveal it right here with you. Oh, great. Uh, It's called Dangerous Allies. Ooh. So very fun. So those, that's what I'm working on. I'm also in the very beginning stages of writing an adult thriller that I don't know if I'll ever be able to do, but I've got some notes on it. That's, that's how early I am in the process, but I've had the idea in mind for years. So I decided to finally start seeing what I can come up with for it. Mm -hmm. So how do you find writing for young adults as opposed to writing for adults? Um, It's it's a totally different thing, isn't it? Young adult and adult is not too different. I I feel like um, children writing for, for like that eight to 12 range, like this series is for, Sure, there's some differences. Like in this kind of a middle grade series, they are absolutely dealing with real life problems. Anything that can happen to an eight to 12 year old can happen in fiction for them as well. I mean, life is messy. Um, But there are things, language choices that, you know, whether it's using certain kinds of words or um, refraining from being too graphic. Um, that's definitely something that you get used to as a middle grade writer. Um, but I have, I have written some short stories for adults, but I haven't really done anything for adults in a, in the form of a book before. 
Hmm. It should be interesting for you to try. Yeah. yeah. Now I have some questions for you about being a writer. What is your favorite part about being a writer on the whole writing and publishing process? Getting up in the morning and going to work in my pajamas. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. My favorite part of being a writer. <laughs> so you don't have to get up and get dressed and, you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> just walk over to my chair and type, type, type. Here we go. Okay. That's great. So what do you consider the most challenging part of the writing process and how do you overcome it? Um, well, part of, I think the most challenging part for me is the waiting. It's waiting for my readers to be able to read the book that I wrote a year and a half before, uh, you know, because I'm already done with the rough draft of book four, which won't be coming out until I think February of 2024. So that's just a little less than a year and a half from now. So it'll, it takes, it, you know, it, it, it's hard to wait. I'm impatient. <laughs> Um, but the writing process itself, I feel like I'm pretty even on that. Like, I, I think maybe it's because I've written 30 books now that maybe I don't find the middles of the books, writing the middle of the book as hard as I used to. I've learned how to do it, you know, um, but I used to find that really daunting. Like I would write the beginning and then I'd be like, okay, what is the middle? What really is the middle of a book? You know, and I start, I would like philosophize about all of this kind of stuff. Like what is the middle? And what, why do we call it that? And I started to look at it in a different way. I thought, okay, instead of writing a middle, I'm going to write the beginning and then I'm going to write the end of the beginning and then immediately start the beginning of the end. And then I write the end and that changed everything for me. I think it was just a mental block that I just needed to uh, see it differently that there doesn't need to be a middle. It's the end of the beginning and the beginning of the end. We'll call it that instead. That is clever. That Thank is you. a very clever idea. <laughs> I love it. It worked for me. <laughs> so what's been your favorite adventure during your writing career? Um, I love to travel. So okay. we do a lot of traveling to do research on places. Um, for instance, in my mind, the the location for the hideout where these the Forgotten Five live, I kind of picture that as being some little secret island area south of Italy. And the place where the big city of Estero is, is probably over at the bottom of Spain. Um, and so that's how I picture the, the world, this fantasy world in my mind. And, um, it's probably, I chose that because I've been to those locations mm -hmm. on tra traveling and just being able to like, see what that part of the world is like. So that played into that. Um, and the city of Estero is a lot like Madrid, for instance, even though it's on the coast, the, the Estero is on the coast of uh, the world that I've created, uh, it looks probably a lot like Madrid. Um, but uh, I did do a, a book signing in Spain once, which was just fabulous. I had the best time. The fans were ri just ridiculously awesome. They were screaming like, that just doesn't really happen that much around the United States. Oh, wow. But going to Spain and uh, doing a book signing there was just amazing. And I would love to do anything like that again. Wow. <laughs> so what is the greatest lesson that you've learned in your writing career? Well, probably the the more books I write and the longer I am a, an author, um, the the more I realize that I'm not nearly as important as I think I am. <laughs> and I think that's a really good lesson for authors to learn that, you know, just don't take yourself too seriously and be humble. Oh, wow. Okay. That's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> 
Well, it's funny because you start out your career as a brand new writer and you go into your book, the bookstore on release day and you expect it to be there all in glory and face out and with the booksellers all knowing everything about it. And they don't. And that's OK. That's normal. You know, that's the way it works. But you find out in a hurry that um, you're not the center of the world. <laughs> well, you having been a bookseller, you know, would know that. <laughs> no, I know I would. I should know that. <laughs> yes, you still like have this this fantasy of what it's going to be like that first moment. I don't mean to to you know rain on anybody's parade. The release day with your first book is a fantastic day, but temper your expectations. <laughs> okay, that's that's good advice. Um, and is that is that the main piece of advice that you would give to new to uh, other writers? Sure. You know, that's definitely something to keep in mind. Um, I do have a piece of advice that I stole from some other author and I don't know who it was. I can't remember where I heard this. Um, well, I do remember where I heard it. It was in Chicago. It was before I'd written any novels and I was kind of walking by a, a room at a conference, a writing conference. Mm -hmm. And I peeked in the door for a minute and the, the person, the author said, Think of the one thing your character would never, ever do and write that down. And so everybody I was watching, like everybody write, wrote down the thing their character would never, ever do. And then when they were done, the author said, now make them do it. Ooh. And that gave me a chill. And then I had to go. And then I didn't pay attention to who the, the author was. I never like went back to look it up and I've used that advice so many times. So whoever you are, thank you for saying it. Um, and I'm sorry, I am not crediting you for your idea. Wow. <laughs> Good idea. That is yeah. chilling, isn't it? Wow. It's chilling. Absolutely. <laughs> but it works. It works. I, I started doing it. Yeah. Whew. Or now, are are there any other groups or uh, clubs or organizations that you'd recommend to others that might have helped you in your career? You know, I I didn't. Okay, so I think I don't have any specific organizations. I mean, I really support SCBWI, uh, but I never had discovered that before I became a published author. So that wasn't really something that was a stepping stone for me. But I highly recommend it. Um, what I do recommend is finding a group of peers who are also writing and sharing your stories with them, and you will all become better writers because of it. Uh, that's when I started writing short stories in about 2002 or so um, with a with a mind of becoming a writer. Um, that was the most important thing that helped me was finding other writers and reviewing each other's work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a number of writers have said that the best thing for them was to meet other writers and to to just work with them and share share the work. And uh, they've said that that's the, the main thing that's really helped them. Yeah. So that's that's great. Um, and now I have some questions for you about you as a person. What is one thing that most people don't know about you, don't realize about you? <laughs> I'm really introverted and anyone who's met me in my career would not probably think that right away um, because, you know, I want to meet my readers and I want to meet other authors. And so, you know, I go out there, I have a great time. I love being, I love doing school visits and doing bookstore visits, but um, it is exhausting to me and I, I have to have quiet time afterward or else I'm never going to make it. <laughs> so I am quite, I mean, my ideal place to be is right here in my little cave and I could stay here forever. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I wish I had a dollar for every author that said that they're introverted, but it's so amazing how People don't seem that way at all. No, you know, it's, no. It's because it's part of our job. We need exactly. to be out there and, you know, <laughs> talk about our books. Exactly. And, you know, and but yet writing is such a solitary thing. You, you have to be alone. You can't write 
when you know when you're talking to other people it's like mm. <laughs> exactly yeah so when, sure. when you're writing do you need silence or music or what absolute silence i cannot write with music i've tried before i don't know how other writers do that um, it just makes me want, you know, think about the, the music instead of writing what I'm supposed to be writing. So I have a, uh, we do sometimes have something on the TV, like just some nature scene, or um, we like to actually watch, uh, there's this, um, there's the, <laughs> this YouTube, live YouTube streaming of uh, a bird feeder in Northern New York. Uh, I uh, shoot. I want to say um, I can't think of where it is right now. I'm really sorry, um, but it is just really fun to watch the birds on our TV, and they make a little bit of noise. But that kind of noise I'm okay with. I can handle like waterfall noise or fireplace that kind of crackling fire, that kind of stuff, that ambient noise, mm -hmm. but um, not music. I can't do that. Okay. So, what does your writing space look like? Oh, it's just a little blue chair with a little orange um, footstool. And I look out the window at the um, ASU, Arizona State University mountain. Ooh. And yeah, it's uh, we're up on a sixth floor in a condo and it's a, it's a nice little view, but yeah, it's just a little space. So what do you need to have around you when you're writing? Um, do you, do you need to have um, do you need to have coffee or water, drinks, food? Not really. I don't I I have water and that's about it. I don't eat while I'm writing. I don't I drink a cup of coffee in the morning and that's it for the day and um just yeah, we drink a lot of water here in Phoenix. <laughs> I would imagine <laughs> yeah. part of life uh because it's very dry, but that's it. That's all I have around me. And um a lot of writers often have furry or feathered or otherwise non-human companions uh, to either help them or hinder them with their work. And do you have any of those and do they help or hinder you? <laughs> we don't at the moment. We have had pets in the past and they've been wonderful. We've had cats and dogs. Um, I have a couple of grand dogs and grand cats, but they don't live near me, but I do get to see them now and then. Uh, but we decided not to get any more animals just because of how much travel we do. Yeah. Uh, it's just so hard on them, you know, to leave them with strangers or, you know, having people come in, having us leave that seemed to be too hard on, on our pets. So we've decided sadly for the moment to not have any of our own, but we do enjoy those grand pets. Yeah. Okay. So what is, or are your um, hobbies or passions when you're not writing? Um, I like to cook. Um, I'm learning baking, which I never thought I would care about. Um, I've always loved to cook, but really wasn't into all uh, how to, you know, like with baking, you have to be so precise with everything. And I just kind of like to wing it kind of like how I write books, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I do enjoy that. I love to read. I love to take walks. It's such a nice place where we live here, where you can walk just about any day of the year. Um, it's wow. a little hot in the summers, but we go yeah. out pretty early in the morning. So yeah, those are my hobbies. I would say we watch a lot of reality TV too. And how do you make time for it when you're writing all the time? <laughs> you know, you kind of have to make time for brainless activities when you are so into a book, you know, spending yeah. six hours a day writing or something, you have to be able to give your brain a break. <laughs> Yeah. Do you, do you structure it? Like, you, do you come in at, you say, yeah, I'm going to work it from eight o'clock in the morning until like two or three, and then that's it? Or I usually work from probably about 6 a.m. until one, and then um, have a leisurely lunch and uh, watch some TV, answer some email. Um, make some meals, you know, stuff like that, and then do a couple of hours in the evening as well. Wow. Okay, great. Um, I just have two more questions for you. 
One is where can people find your work aside from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester? And I always give a plug for Annie's and say that we can, that you can get Lisa's books at Annie's if you call us at 508-796-5613, or you can send us email at orders at anniesbooksworcester.com. Now, where else can people find your books? Oh, they're in many, many independent bookstores around the country. Uh, in Canada, in other countries as well, um, and uh, Barnes and Noble. I mean, Amazon, of course. But I would love for you to give Annie's a call and pick up your books. Thank you. <laughs> um, we also did a little tour of the of the Northeast over the summer and stopped at a bunch of other stores and signed some stock. So you never know if you're in. Uh, Annie's area and you but you want a signed copy you might be able to find one somewhere around there great okay and my last question for you is how can we follow your work and share your awesomeness oh well um you can find me on social media at mm -hmm. lisa underscore mcmahon and that is like twitter instagram tiktok uh, i just joined post the other day we'll see how that goes um, and I've got a website, lisamcmahon.com. You can also check out the unwanted series.com, which is for the unwanted series. Um, I have a YouTube channel that I don't use very much, but, uh, yeah. And I'm on Facebook as well. Um, McMahon fan, I think is the, the backslash or forward slash McMahon fan on Facebook. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for uh, for joining me. It was it was fun. Um, and maybe if you get to this area again you know, around the Worcester area, you will come and visit us. I would absolutely love to do that. That would be great, Lisa McMahon. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure. Take care. Bye.